This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. Joining us today for episode 89 is Jungian analyst Michael Marsman in Berkeley, California. He is a graduate of the Jungian Psychoanalytic Association training program in New York City, of which he is a faculty member, supervisor, and former board member. He is also a member of the C.G. Jung Institute of San Francisco and the International Association for Analytical Psychology. Michael has taught and presented nationally and internationally on diverse topics such as Hindu mythology, analytic ethics, transgenderism, archetypes and the collective unconscious, and amplification. Previously, a certified public accountant and controller of a multi-million dollar investment bank, he currently serves as treasurer and board member of the Philemon Foundation, the organization that brought the Red Book and the Black Books of C.G. Jung to publication. He is licensed in both California and New York and sees individuals and couples in person and or via telehealth and teletherapy. Among the people he works with, are those identifying as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, and queer-slash-questioning, as well as those who are addicted, in recovery, and with people for whom spirituality, both Eastern and Western, is an integral part of life. His research focuses on Hindu mythology and gender and sexuality. Among his published works are Bringing Dharma to Earth, in Spring Journal's Fall 2013 issue, Jung and India, Transgenderism and Transformation, an Attempt at a Jungian Understanding, in the Journal of Analytical Psychology's November 2017 issue, and Kali, in Praise of the Goddess, in the November 2019 issue of Psychological Perspectives. Please visit the website speakingofjung.com where you will find links to everything discussed in this episode in the show notes. This interview is being recorded on Tuesday, June 15th, 2021, through the magic of Zoom. Thank you so much for joining us today, Michael. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. So we're here to talk about a lot of different topics today. And when I was preparing to record with you, I came across something uh, on your website. You did a talk for the Red Book Dialogues back in 2010, early 2010. The Red Book was published in late 2009. And you interviewed a gentleman named Mike Chico for the Rubin Museum's um, talks about the Red Book. It's so interesting. Would you tell us about it? Yeah, this the, that my talk was part of a uh, a series of Red Book dialogues um, that took place at the Rubin Museum in New York. And at the time, Jungians from all over the world converged. Uh, because finally Jung's Red Book had been uh, published and the original copy was on display in New York. Um, so as part of the, uh, as part of the exhibit, uh, uh, various Jungian analysts um, sat down with people, mostly celebrities, mm-hmm. and had a dialogue about images from the Red Book. So images were projected on the wall and... Um, and uh, the analyst and the guest uh, spoke about it. And as I said, most of the uh, most of the guests were celebrities. And the person, uh, Mike, uh, with whom I had the great fortune and honor uh, to dialogue with, was a super uh, superintendent of one of the buildings uh, of one of the uh, uh, the people involved in one of the other dialogues. And I have to say, it was such a moving experience yes. where he really opened up and connected to uh, uh, connected to the image and connected to his life. And um, and I remember it wasn't that uh, well attended. And and so, of course, I was thinking, oh, I wish there were more people here. You know, my ego was getting in the way. Mm-hmm. Um, but I found it to be so moving, and he was so open. And the audience really uh, uh, came together. There was so much love and support and intimacy 
really because of his honesty, because of his honesty and his vulnerability. And it was really quite moving. Well, here we are 11 years later, and we're talking about it. So I I thank them for recording it. Uh, The audio ran on WNYC's Talk To Me series. And so there is a link to the audio on your website, and I will have a link to it in the show notes for this episode. And I, I, I encourage everyone to listen because it's, it's pretty extraordinary. And it's part of the same series that Beverly Zabriskie, who was our guest in episode 85, her talk with Leonard Nimoy, which was at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, was part of the same series, the Red Book Dialogues. Yeah, and it's funny because, Laura, you and I were talking before yeah. the podcast formally began. And I had done that talk when I was uh, still in training, and I had just finished my comprehensive exam, I think around the same week or, or maybe a few weeks before that. Mm-hmm. And um, and so, you know, it's the type of thing where you go and you listen to yourself and you see yourself on a video uh, 10 years earlier, 11 years earlier, and you think, oh, my God, what was yep. I saying? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, because I had shared with you that, yeah, because we're planning on talking about addiction in this episode today. And I had gone back and listened to episode eight that I recorded at the IRSJA's fall conference, which was held here in Chicago in 2015. And I recorded it in person uh, with David Shane, who's wonderful. And I sound like I'm a teenager and knew nothing about Jung. I mean, I just, I cringed so bad when I heard that. Anyway, well, it, it's a great episode, and I, and I hope that everyone will listen uh, who, who has an interest in, in addiction. And, and you know what it is also? The, um, basically, what we're talking about when you go back and you listen to yourself and you have the, oh, my God, experience. Yeah. Jung talked about an experience of the self being a defeat for the ego. Right. And so what that means is that uh, whenever we grow and mature and learn new things and become conscious, um, where there's always or oftentimes sort of an embarrassment mm-hmm. at having been unconscious in the first place. So, so you look back to where you were, and, um, and it's important really to be uh, compassionate with yourself and, and to recognize that life is this pro- constant movement. And so you're always going to be in a different place. And, and also, um, you know, things we said earlier, I mean, this, this episode, you know, as your episode really touched people and it was spontaneous and it was alive. And that's what really matters. Not so much that that's what, that's, what's really important. You know, as I said, my ego concerns were kind of getting in the way. How many people are here? What did I sound like? That's not what it was about. Right. Right. And thank you for those reminders. So in the intro, I mentioned the three essays that you've published, and I wanted to go over each of them um, just briefly to let people know that they're out there because they're so very interesting. And the first one uh, that appeared in the Spring Journal issue of Jung and India is titled Bringing Dharma to Earth. And would you read the subtitle? Because I cannot pronounce those names. The, the Sabramala Pilgrimage in Ayapan Myth. And Ayapan is a not very well-known Hindu god. His name means father of fathers. And he was the son of two male Hindu gods, Shiva and Vishnu. Yes, Exactly. So this was actually your dissertation. So what drew you to this? I mean, what 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 is this about? So I was at a Hindu temple. Um, Somebody had brought me to a Hindu temple and they pointed to Ayyappan and they said, you know, that's the son of uh, of Shiva and Vishnu. And Shiva and Vishnu were two out of the three uh, main Hindu gods, um, Brahma being the uh, the other one. And so um, I thought, wow, this is really cool that a major religion uh, has something like this as, as part of their canon, mm-hmm. that, um, that two gods can produce a son. And I thought that's really interesting, um, considering uh, our view towards sexuality and gender societally, 
to recognize that in a religion um, that's thousands and thousands of years old, that there's a place for this and that there's a place for all kinds of configurations of masculine and feminine and male and female energies. And so I became curious about this god, Ayyappan. Um, uh, and then it turns out that, um, that one of the largest pilgrimages in the world happens every year to his shrine. And I, I forgot how many people visit it, but millions of people, um, uh, men mainly, um, there's a controversy over this because women could go as long as they're not of menstruating age. And, oh, and wow. um, um, but now that's becoming um, uh, debated, hotly debated. Mm -hmm. It's in the state of Kerala. Um, go visit this this uh, divine child, basically. The God represents a divine child. And so in the paper, I thought, um, you know, what is this for? What is this trying to express? And what's the mythology behind it? Why, in other words, um, why was it necessary and what was it for and what was trying to be accomplished and expressed through the creation of this young child God? Mm -hmm. and, and the paradox is, is that it's a child God, a divine child whose name means father of fathers. So what's that about? Yeah. And why the uh, fascination with him? You said it's the largest pilgrimage. Yeah, it's um, it's one of the largest pilgrimages in the world. And so uh, my question, as a, as a Jungian, and, and you and I talked about this, mm -hmm. um, I always ask not what's wrong with this or um, why is this happening? But my question is, what does this mean? What is it for? What's trying to be expressed through this? So when we talk about addiction, uh, my, I don't look at addiction as a pathology as such to say, well, what's wrong with it? It's a problem. We have to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. um, but what's it for? What's it pushing towards? What does it mean? So the same thing in, in the paper about transgenderism. My question was, it's interesting that transgenderism now um, seems to be a, uh, a phenomenon that's becoming more prominent in our culture. So, you know, the question people ask is, um, oh, you know, what's the pathology here? What's wrong with it? You know, that, that's, that's kind of common, right? There are right. the debates over, um, over bathroom laws and playing in sports and things like that, uh, all these judgments. My question is, huh, I wonder what it means in society. Where are things heading? Where are things moving? And, and so when I approached this uh, Ayyappan, and, and, and again, this, this child of, of Shiva, the son of Shiva and Vishnu, I wanted to know, what's this for? What, what conditions uh, necessitated the uh, creation of a god from two men or from two males? Mm -hmm. So that, that, that was my question. He's also a trickster, which yeah. I found very interesting. And it, it, so is that, that part of the myth? that th people know him for? Um, not so much his tricksterism, mm -hmm. although there's tricksterism throughout the myth. Like part of how he was created is that Vishnu uh, off, um, several times throughout the Puranas, these, these uh, uh, Hindu scriptures, has taken on the form of... Uh, of uh, taken on female form uh, 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 a, um, uh, uh, by the name of Mohini. And Mohini means enchantress. So Vishnu is taken on the form of, Mo of Mohini, the enchantress. And Shiva um, wanted to see Vishnu in the Mohini form. So he asked Vishnu, Vishnu said, okay, I'll be right back. And Vishnu comes back and Vishnu uh, shows up as Mohini, the most beautiful, voluptuous woman uh, that you could imagine. And the Puranas describe her in just such vivid, uh, vivid detail. And, um, and they don't shy away from that, which is wonderful. Um, you know, the large breasts and, the, and the, her 
belly button and, and the, you know, her swaying hips. And, um, and then they say that when Shiva saw Mohini, he got so excited that he ran after her like a, like a bull elephant after a female elephant. Mm. And when they got together, um, Shiva ejaculated and up from the ground um, um, sprung Ayapan, basically. Okay. So it was seen as a creation of, of, uh, of Shiva and Vishnu. That's an incident of tricksterism. And, and Hindu mythology is all full of tricksterism. What's the purpose of that? I think tricksterism, it, it furthers the drama. I, not, not, I don't mean in the drama. I mean, it furthers the process. That, um, that tricksterism um, is a way of, uh, of moving things uh, where they need to move. Like what tricksterism does is uh, tricksterism breaks down forms. So when things become too rigid or too ossified or we take things too seriously, the trickster comes in and it breaks that down. When our egos start to become too important and too fixed, uh, tricksterism breaks the ego position. So sometimes it could mean, um, let's say you're, you're uh, trying to get to an important meeting and right when you get to the subway station, the train leaves and you miss it. You know, that could be tricksterism mm -hmm. or um, uh, tricksterism um, is when something breaks or goes wrong. And maybe maybe what it, what it does is it allows you or forces you to have to examine your relationship to that thing. So in Hindu mythology, it oftentimes takes tricksterism to further a process along. At the end of the essay, you quote a letter from Jung or by Jung to his former student, an Indian analyst, and in which he emphasizes a need for active embodiment in lived life, as opposed to a spiritual move away from it. Would you say a little bit about that? Yeah. So it has been said, and I don't know if I agree with this, but um, I think Vivekananda said this, and also Jung talked about this, that, at the time, that in some way um, in India, there has been a, a spiritual development and sort of grounded relationship to life and to physical things hasn't been as developed as it is in the, the West. So. We're very good in terms of progress, business progress, manufacturing, and bench, uh, um, uh, uh, things like that. Um, um, intellectual development. Um, not that India hasn't been, but we pretty we we're pretty good at sort of mastering the physical world. Right. But our spiritual development is at a very low level. You know, to the extent that we develop atom bombs that can destroy the world. Yet, um, we have no relationship to psyche or self that can protect us from this, you know, that, that can help us develop the right relationship to it so we don't destroy the world. I mean, in some way, that's what global warming is about, right? We have the technology um, that's, that's, um, that we've been genius in developing um, to be able to enable us to live the lives that we want, but we've uh, at the expense of our relationship to Earth. Yeah. And so, um, so we don't have the right relationship to it, that, that we think that we, we're of the highest order. So it's a very egocentric position that we have in the West. Mm -hmm. um, so we think that we're gods, basically. We act like we're gods. And, um, and in India, um, the spiritual development is, 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 has been quite profound. And, and it's been part of the culture. <clears throat> and integrated and infused in Indian life, um, you know, for millennia. And so, um, um, so what Ayyappan represented and the whole purpose of the, the myth in some way, I think was to enable men to have a kind of different relationship to an embodied, grounded masculinity uh, so that they would be able to um, uh, kind of gain a mastery or to um, 
uh, to be able to be better related uh, to themselves in their physical lives. So there is the spiritual life and spiritual development. And I think uh, a yuppin represents sort of bringing a kind of masculine grounded potency. This gets kind of complicated. Yeah. Uh, we usually, we think of the, um, in a symbolic sense, of the material world as being um, more feminine and the spiritual world as being more masculine mm -hmm. in a symbolic sense. Mm -hmm. And a yuppin had to do with a, uh, a kind of a grounded masculine potency. Ah, I see. And then let's now move to your essay on transgenderism and transformation. And its subtitle is An Attempt at a Jungian Understanding. And something that you point out, which uh, I thought was important, is that this experience that that seems to be prevalent in the world, I mean, you say it's transgenderism is all the rage, um, that it's it's been around for centuries, if not millennia. It's nothing new because it seemed like all of a sudden it came out of nowhere and I was seeing it everywhere. And I wondered why. And and then I, I was talking to somebody about it and they said, well, it's it's been around. We just didn't know about it because there wasn't as, as many ways to share that kind of information before. So how do you see this as far as in this point in time? Yeah, it's interesting because I think that, um, you know, we're at a time where, uh, well, so it's be, it seems to be um, becoming prevalent, even though it's all, let's say it's always been around. Okay. Um, let's assume it's always been around. Um, but it's, it's, it's something that's becoming um, popular in culture now, and it's becoming part of the collective consciousness meaning that it's something that now all society is aware of. So there's something about uh, where their psyche is heading um, that now is ripe for this, that, I, that it has to do with, uh, on a collective level, uh, the relationship to gender that's changing and evolving and progressing. And so I think it's just now hit a time where I think we're ripe for it. Okay. And and who can predict or who know what who knows when anything like that happens? You know, when when does new awareness suddenly come and why? And um, I don't know that we can say. Mm -hmm. you, you write that it represents a collective shift towards a new or more differentiated way of experiencing and expressing sex and gender, a movement of world soul. Yeah. So I, and I'll tell you how I came about writing this paper. I had been working in a clinic in New York uh, um, and working with um, a lot of people, uh, transgender people, mm -hmm. um, transgender patients. And I was trying to work out my position on it because I thought that I had to have a position. And I was sort of wondering, you know, is transgenderism something that needs to just happen symbolically and people are literalizing it and is that a problem or is that i just wasn't really sure mm -hmm. i was just there with people's experiences but um but i just wanted to to kind of work out um what my position was on it how, how i felt about it what i thought about it so i so i wrote this paper and and it, it, it the paper i think really made me uh it really was helpful um, because, um, again, I start with that question, what does something mean? Where is it heading? What's trying to be expressed through this? Not is it good or bad or right or wrong or problematic or not problematic. It's where is it heading? What's, where, where's the psyche pushing for? What, what kind of new experience is being, is psyche wanting to have? What's the frontier that we're on? Um, and so, there is, you know, and, and, and again, just to, just to um, um, explain this, that um, there's sex and, and sex that we're assigned at birth, meaning in some way who we are biologically when we're born. So 
biologically, I'm, I'm male, meaning that the doctors decided at birth that I'm going to be labeled as a male. So we could say for all intents and purposes, biologically, I'm male. It always had been assumed that the gender, and gender is, is how, you, how one experiences oneself. And so we have thought that gender and sex are the same. If you're born a male, then you experience yourself right. as a male. And what transgenderism is about is that who you are born and how you experience yourself can be two separate things. As is sexual orientation, mm -hmm. as is gender role. All these things get further differentiated. I mean, it used to be, you know, mainstream for the most part, that if you, if you had um, XY chromosomes and you were born a male, then you experienced yourself as a male and that you liked women and that you um, played sports and liked to get into fights as a child and then went into engineering or business or you became a professor. Mm -hmm. And vice, you know, and, and similarly, if you were uh, born as a woman. Well, now all these things become further differentiated. So you can be a woman, you can be born as a born female, XX chromosome, and you can be attracted to men, and you can um, decide to be a nurse or a school teacher, and you can experience yourself as a man. So uh, these things, be, you know, these aspects become further differentiated. So what I realized through the paper, at least where I think transgenderism is heading, is that how we experience our own gender doesn't have to be tied to our biology. And it doesn't have to be tied to core sense of self. That, that the term gender comes from the Latin gendere, um, which mean, which has to do with creation and trans means to move across. So I see uh, transgenderism as a movement of the, as a, as a, as a creative movement of gender. So that perhaps we're getting to the point in society where our gender doesn't have to be fixed, that we can experience ourselves as male, female, any combination of that, and it doesn't have to uh, be tied to our core sense of self or our biology. And I think that's where things seem to be heading. So we weren't in a place where we could um, kind of function that way as a society before, but we can now? Is that what you're seeing? Well, I think we're heading there. Okay. I think, I think we're heading in that direction in the same way where um, if you experience yourself as a man, um, you can still, um, you know, in the 80s, in the 70s and 80s, um, we started talking about um, getting in touch with a feminine side mm -hmm. or being right. a feeling man, or, you know, women could be, you know, women, uh, men could become nurses. So gender roles were loosening up, right? You didn't have to, you didn't have to perform a certain role in society or be a particular way because you were a particular sex. And so I think now we're at the point where even how we experience ourselves may be loosening up, that it doesn't have to be predefined and it doesn't have to be biologically based. Right. Yeah, I was just wondering why now, uh, just even for instance, and I, I'm going to mention this because I've mentioned it on the podcast before, on Monday nights, I watch The Bachelor and The Bachelorette just as just is entertainment, just as something fun to watch. And I've been watching it over the years. Yes, I know. I mean, I have a problem with it too, but I've been <laughs> watching it. So right now, The Bachelorette is airing. And so there's one a, a woman, a female heterosexual woman, and she is being courted by 30 men. And I've been watching this over the years. And what I've noticed is in this season is how the men are not as macho and 
and burly and just kind of like stereotypical guy, I've noticed men, the, these men are in their their 20s, maybe early 30s at the oldest, are much more, uh, have more, what I, uh, I don't even know if I'm saying this right, have more feminine qualities than years ago and are dressing more, more, uh, more stylish and, and refined. I, I, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, but what I'm saying, what I'm tra- wanting to say is that I'm noticing a shift and it seems like things are becoming more toward, more balanced, maybe where we had these stereotypes before and things are coming more toward the center. Yeah, in some way, this this has to do with gender role, how a man is supposed to be and how a woman is supposed to be. And and that's loosened up. Loosened up, yes. But is it a balance? Is it coming more in balance? Because men and women seemed like they were on, like, say, the 50s. Okay, we were on opposite ends of the spectrum uh, as a as a society and the stereotypical man and woman and now we're coming more toward the center that's how i see it i think at least on a superficial level okay. on that level and i don't make i shouldn't say just superficial because i think that's really important because we're also um you know in our culture we're moving towards uh, more expression of self and more expression of individuality, um, where in in some way you know we're being encouraged to express ourselves the way that we want to. Well, I just want to jump in there too because yeah. I, I use this show as an example because not only and and I and I stop there, but not only is it the way that the men are presenting themselves and dressing. But the way that they're carrying themselves and they're crying and they're opening up and they're talking about their feelings and they're talking about, you know, the death of a parent or being bullied in school. And I don't remember that happening years ago where men are willing to be vulnerable, talk about their feelings, cry on national television, uh, have their heart broken, talk about it. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really important. Exactly. So there's movement towards that. And, um, you know, the psyche's ways are mysterious. Um, um, Who knows on an individual level or on a cultural level uh, where things are going to head and where things where things move and why they do when they do. Um, uh, There's something I was just well, like, for example, you know, I think what's really interesting is that I noticed that. uh, with younger people, I think people like 40 and younger or in their early 40s and younger, um, that men and women um, allow, you know, uh, so there have been men who have had sex with other men that wouldn't uh, define themselves as gay. Okay. And so sometimes, uh, or women who have sex with women and don't define themselves as lesbian, let's mm-hmm. say. And, um, you know, people have said, yeah, you know, I had sex with another guy and, you know, it just didn't really interest me. You know, I just tried it. It wasn't my thing. And um, so there's all sorts of openness and experimentation that's different than people who are older. Certainly it's different than it was in my day right. where where there's more of a pressure to define yourself. So to uh, so um, if you were to have sex, if you're over a certain age. You would, if you had sex with a man, that meant that you're gay, mm-hmm. and you and you would you wouldn't consider having sex with a man if you're a man if you weren't gay, let's say, or you chalk it up to you know to being really drunk one night or or something like that. Um, but it does seem as though that younger generations are, uh, are where their sexual expression is more fluid and. It's sort of less neurotic. They have less sort of crap associated, you know, connected right. to it. In some way, there's there's a lot less shame and a lot more openness. Yes. I mean, there are shadow sides also to it. What do you mean? Well, some of the shadow side is that sex and sexuality 
is very is actually quite powerful and so um so you really uh it's important to develop a kind of consciousness as to what your relationship to sex is. And, um, and so I think that's important as well. You know, in some way with sex, um, and I know we're getting a feel from your question. Oh, that's okay. Um, but in some way, um, sex has, um, you know, in some way, maybe it was too reified in the past that it was, uh, um, a rarefied, I mean, that it was sort of too, uh, too holy. And so mm-hmm. sex was only meant within the context of marriage, and it was a sacred, holy thing. And, um, and so um, that that's one pole. And then the other pole is sort of the instinctual, mm-hmm. um, you know, pleasurable, casual end. And, and I think that it's important to kind of find the balance and, and to recognize um, what's the proper relationship to sex and sexuality. That makes me wonder if this is maybe a compensation for the way we've been. The subtitle of, of, your, of your essay is an attempt at a Jungian understanding. So what would... I get this question. I get really irritated when people ask me this because who knows what the answer is. And here I am about to ask you, what would Jung say about this? So what would Jung say about where we are now with this? The anima, the animus. What, What would Jung say? Yeah, that's hard for me to answer. But well, the Jung of my fantasy. Okay. Um, what I imagine Jung would say. Maybe how I like to think of Jung and what I would want him to say um, is, again, he'd ask the question, what is this for? What does it mean? You know, the thing about Jung is that uh, he had said that, you know, his theories are just that, that they're always subject to change. Um based on evidence, based on realities. And so that the theories uh, weren't meant to be fixed. And they weren't meant to become dogma. So I would imagine that uh, how he understood sex and sexuality and gender would also have changed. Yeah. You know, for example, like when I work with the concept of anima and animus, I see it more as function rather than fixed form. So the anima has to do with uh, a kind of soulful connectedness and relating, and it, it, it usually carries um, feeling, and, um, and it has to do with uh, being a bridge to the unconscious. Mm-hmm. And so uh, whether that form, whether it's in the form of a man or whether it's in the form of a, of a woman, I think we have to look at the function. I think that's more important. So in a gay male psyche, in a gay man psyche, um, I think anima can be depicted as male or female, and we just really have to look at how the image is functioning. I I think we have to do that with any image Mm -hmm. that shows up in a dream. I think we have to be careful of, of concretizing psychic images and saying, just because the image is that, it means that. Right. I think we have to look at how it's functioning uh, within the context of the dream as a whole and within the context of the patient psyche. Would you like to move into Kali now and your paper, Kali in Praise of the Goddess? I, I used to have a mouse pad with her image on it. And I had it for many years. I got it in Santa Fe. And there's the Hindu goddess Kali holding a severed head, wearing a necklace of skulls, dancing on, what is she dancing on? Dead bodies? On Shiva. That's a, no, that's a, she's, she's dancing a, on Shiva's uh, body. Well, Shiva's li- well, actually Shiva is lying there on the ground in order to kind of um, break Kali's dance so that it stops and it doesn't get out of control. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. She's not dancing on a dead body. She's dancing on Mm. Shiva. Shiva. And she's got her tongue out and she is crazed. 
Yep. And you point out how in Western religion, Western psychology, she's often uh, seen as the terrible mother. But in India, in the East, she is the manifestation of the divine feminine and seen as a savior and a protector. So I think that when I bought this mouse pad, I wasn't really sure what it was attracting me to to Kali. And everybody who saw it was just horrified by it. And I didn't explain her. I just let her be. And she keeps coming up for me uh, in, in, in my world, in my environment. And I would love for you to tell us about why you wrote about her. Okay. So that's funny that it's your mouse pad. Um, the, you know, in, in gods, Indian gods have vehicles. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and so the mouse is the vehicle of, of the god Ganesha, which is the elephant-headed god. Yes. Um, and so it's interesting because so Kali is a mouse pad, right? Kali is a ground by uh, is the, is is kind of a groundedness by which your your mouse can gain traction so that you can uh, manipulate your computer screen. Mm-hmm. You know, you can select things. You can mm-hmm. you can. So in some way, Kali allows you to be. <laughs> right? Yep. She allows you to. Kali allows you to. Um, to affect movement and allows you to to affect change. In some way, that's what the mother does. The mother is the ground of being, right? It's that which allows us to exist. So Kali as your mouse pad allows you to exist in the cyber world. It allows you to move through it. Yeah, um, I like that. Um, so, so I love that you have Kali. So again, um, Oh, I've always been fascinated. Yeah, I've been fascinated by Kali. Her image is so compelling. Mm-hmm. Um, as you describe, you know, you, you describe her. She is fierce looking with wild hair and in and, and a lolling red tongue and blood dripping from her and skulls. Fascinating. And in the West, again, we've we as you mentioned. We've considered to her to be an image of the terrible mother, mm-hmm. the devouring mother. But I think that also reflects that looking at her that way um, reflects our attitude towards the feminine in yeah, our culture right. in general. Because um, we've, we've been afraid of the feminine in our culture. And I want to differentiate uh, feminine from female. Yes. Please. And by female, I mean, um, you know, male or female, I mean, sort of embodied form. But by feminine and masculine, I mean energies. And uh, the problem with the term feminine and masculine is they're almost it's almost as if they're too gendered. and We could say yin and yang or something else, but it doesn't really quite capture it. We haven't really found ways to replace it. But if the feminine has to do with relatedness, earthiness, um, um, interdependence, it has to do with kind of containing and holding, it has to do with love. If the masculine uh, has to do with progress and and, uh, being potent, and moving in the world in a powerful and effective way. And it has to do with a kind of linearity and an upward movement progress. Um, it has to do with inde- independence in, in less permeable boundaries. Um, our, the feminine has been suffering. And if we look at, you know, Father Sky and Mother Earth, look mm-hmm. what's happening to the Earth. Mm-hmm. So we've denigrated the feminine in Western culture, where we've wanted to kind of marginalize the feminine and keep it down. So when I when I said when you talk about shows like The Bachelor and men are more in touch with their feelings and things like that, um, that may very well be and that may be good, but but is this show 
really about relatedness and connectedness or is it about you know is it about ratings is it about yeah, it, it, yeah. you know and it could yeah. be both but in mm-hmm. our but in our culture um um if you if we how do we value relatedness in our culture how do we value community orientation versus independent success um you know, these are things we, so in politics, for example, whether politicians are, are male or female, how much do we value femininity in politics? Do we value relatedness, vulnerability, um, community, caring for one another, containing, or is all about success and progress and me versus you? Um, this is what we have to look at. So, in terms of Kali in India, Kali is looked upon as the um, as a divine loving mother, because Kali see the the skulls that you see hanging around Kali's neck, mm-hmm. and the blood that you see dripping from her, those aren't uh, human blood or skulls. It's 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 uh, it's uh, it's the blood and skulls of a demon of demons. The head she's holding is a demon's skull. So I look at demon, demons uh, in psychological language are complexes. And so Kali was created in order to uh, address and approach and help defeat demonic complexes that, um, that destroy psychic order, that destroy psychic functioning. So in some way, Kali is, represents the maternal regulating function of the psyche. I, I can give you, you know, one of the Akali, there was this a demon named Rakta Bija, which means blood drop, blood, blood seed. And every time um, they, you would approach this demon, Rakta Bija, uh, and try to kill him with a sword, um, he would spill his blood, and out of each drop of blood, like hundreds, a hundred or a thousand of rock beaches would grow. Mm-hmm. So Kali then came, who was bloodthirsty, um, to lap up, uh, to, to, to lap up the blood of rock Bija so that no more demons would be born out of that. And so if you look at that symbolically, the sword is actually the sword. Um, could be seen as masculine and that it's penetrating and it's incisive and it's um, in, in, uh, it represents intellect and truth. And so if you look at, if the sword has to do also with separating, that's what we do in analysis. And so in an, if, if you look at... Um, uh, Rock to Bija is being this demon that just keeps multiplying itself. If you see um, uh, Rock to Bija is maybe representing something obsessive or compulsive, let's say addiction, mm-hmm. then intellectual understanding, analysis of the problem, trying to um, penetrate the problem, that only makes it worse. Here, Kali comes in. And Kali uh, is in this frenzy. She gets ferocious. She's angry. Um, she, she ferociously goes after, after Rakta Bija. So it may mean that there's this kind of um, ferocious, this ferocious sort of feminine that rather than penetrate and try to differentiate and try to understand the strong emotion that can consume this sort of compulsive demon um, swallows it up. It can metabolize it. It may mean that um, with certain things that trying to understand it, figuring it out, um, that's not good enough. Sometimes it takes strong emotion. You know, I can't take this anymore. I'm sick of this, right? I'm sick of this. Mm -hmm. This is awful. Sometimes it takes that to start the problem of, to start the, the process of metabolizing, of addressing. You know, so for an addict hitting bottom, I can't take this anymore. This is awful. You know, my whole life is ruined. What am I doing? It sometimes takes that kind of emotion 
in order to begin to metabolize and address the problem of, say, alcohol. Something that came up uh, this week or last week on Twitter is solvent coagula. And it, it kept coming up last week. And then I see in your paper on page 191, Kali symbolizes the ongoing process of creation and destruction, the alchemical dissolution and coagulation, the life of psychic process. Yeah. And there it is again. Yeah. What it means is that um, things get too fixed. Thing, things become too rigid and ossified and lose their life. Um, sometimes we get stuck in something. We, you know, we can get stuck in an old attitude um, and, and wonder why our lives are the way they are. Everything seems dead. Nothing seems interested, uh, interesting to us. And sometimes it actually takes um, a kind of dissolution. It takes a, a sort of dissolving of our fixed ego position. And it can be awful when it happens. Sometimes crisis in what seems like crisis and seem or, or disaster um, in our lives is actually necessary in order for us to kind of reform. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it happens in a very minor way, like when you're stuck on something and you go take a shower. And when you're in the shower, a new idea comes to you. Mm -hmm. That water is dissolving. Water, water is its solution, right? We call it a solution. The solution came to me. The solution is 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 it's the dissolved. So um, so it can happen in a minor way where uh, you have to loosen things up, and 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 so we become too fixed and rigid, and we have to see things in a new way and experience things in a new way. And sometimes that takes a falling apart. Sometimes that takes a falling apart. Yeah. And I like how you point out that it is the eruption of anger, often in projected form, that promotes healing. And you say that in your essay on Kali. So anger, and my analysts used to say this all the time, anger is not a bad thing, necessarily, or a wrong thing. So it can be very useful. It's a big thing with me. Um, to mm -hmm. that, um, in our culture, um, that we're so anti anger, yeah. and people always talk about, well, anger management, I have to get rid of my anger, my anger is a problem. And anger does cause a problem for a lot of people. But for me, the the solution, right, the, 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 the dissolve mm -hmm. is not to, to get rid of the anger. But it's to understand what's it for, what's trying to be expressed. Mm -hmm. Anger is legitimate. My assumption is, if, is that if somebody is very angry, they have a reason to be angry. Mm -hmm. And what is that? Mm -hmm. You know, again, anger, right? I'm fed up. I can't take this anymore. Anger, anger can be a motive force. Anger, sometimes I, um, um, an analyst that I know um, used to speak of it this way, that He's, he saw our anger as the, the, the energy, you know, the chick breaking through the shell or the, or the seed pushing through the ground. You know, a mother sees a child crossing the street and about to get hit by a car. What are you doing? Stop. Mm -hmm. Right? The anger can save the person's life. Yeah. Anger is an expression of, of go no further. Stop there. I'm protecting myself. So anger is, is, is as useful as any other emotion. It's as necessary. It's part of who we are. And as you see in the myth, it's Kali's anger that restores psychic functioning. Mm -hmm. Without Kali's anger, without Durga, Durga is this, other, is this fierce um, goddess um, that slays a, a demon, um, Mahishasura, that's a buffalo, form of a buffalo, Without Durga's anger, um, psychic order doesn't get restored. Things are in disarray. Sometimes you need that anger in order to, that the destructive anger, it can be actually quite constructive. Thank you for pointing that out. I love that. Thank you. It's just not usually framed that way. And uh, to me, it's the only way. So mm -hmm. how does the topic of addiction factor into Kali. I know you've touched on that. And I just would like to point out that uh, one of the reasons why I, I invited you to do this episode 
um, because I wanted to talk about addiction and recovery because I noticed in the analytics for the Speaking of Jung website, which has been online since August of 2015, the most visited page on the website, aside from the main page, the front page, speakingofjung.com, the most visited page is in the blog. There is a blog section. Uh, I don't post much there, but on November 14th, 2015, I posted the letters between Jung and the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, Bill W. The letters were exchanged in January of 1961, which is the year of Jung's death. So this was just a few months before he died. And I've always just been amazed that that is the most visited page of this entire website. And I wanted to to talk about that uh, with someone who is actively working with uh, addicts and uh, you are a Jungian analyst, so you're, you're coming at it from that perspective. And so what did Jung have to say to, to Bill W about, he's using alcoholism, but that could be, the same for really any addiction, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Before we go to Jung, I just would like to ask you how you define addiction. So if an analyzan comes to you and has these issues or these struggles, do you, do you label things as an addiction or do you just work with the struggles, the images that come up? Yeah, it depends on what works for a particular person. Okay. Because what I what I try to do is when I work with somebody is um, um, work with um, whatever language and whatever image is really going to touch them in their lives. Because um, I find that um, you know a lot of people, uh, analysts, people in training. Um, you know, we can, we can, uh, translate things into psychological language. You know, this is a complex and this is the anima and this is the shadow and this is how they interact. But what I find most important is to then to be able to take how you understand something conceptually and psychologically and translate it into lived life experience. Mm -hmm. So that a person you're working with or a person that you're talking with is really going to be get, is really going to get how it manifests in their lives, what it means to them. So, you know, I can talk about Kali and what Kali means theoretically, but that's not how Kali shows up in somebody's life. Mm -hmm. Like, that's why I said, you know, if you feel yourself getting really, really angry, I'm sick of this. I need to do this. I need to go after that. If you if you can sometimes think of Kali as sort of a fury that impels you to really tackle something that's just been getting at you for a long time, I find that's a that's a better way to relate to Kali. Mm -hmm. You know, you know the feeling of it. You know, you know, you, you know, you get it. it, it, it you've got. Um, so the same thing with addiction. Sometimes it's useful. Sometimes it's not to use the terminology. I. In my own conception, separate what I call big A addiction and little A addiction. Okay. Like big A alcoholism would be I can't stop drinking and drinking is destroying my life. And, um, um, you know, I'm losing jobs and I'm losing um, my relationship and I'm having liver. You know, big A addiction is this real um, um obvious compulsion but then there are people let's say who come home and have a um two or three drinks every night and function perfectly you know they're perfectly fine in the way that they function in life mm -hmm. um or um let's say um somebody you know they come home like every day throughout the day um let's say they're they're getting um getting stoned you know they're, they're smoking weed and um you know it doesn't really create a problem but so the big A addiction, I look at it as that first obvious example, alcoholism destroys your life. But then I look at small, what I call small A addiction is, is 
are you sort of compelled to have to have your state of mind changed? Like, what is it? What's your relationship to alcohol? What's your relationship to marijuana? What's your relationship to sex? Is it, are, are you needing to, to have something alter your state of being? And if you're dependent on something altering your state of being, then we have to really look at that. And maybe that's like some small A addiction. And maybe it's not big A addiction in that it's not destroying your life. But what's it doing to your psychic life? What's it doing to the life of your soul? And so, um, you know, there's a lot of stigma that gets attached to addiction. And, and, and we all have things, well, most of us tend to have things we're addicted to, um, maybe little a. Um, you know, we have to look at what what is it doing in our lives and what is it a substitute for? So I I sometimes tend to working with people, even move away from, are you addicted? Aren't you addicted? Mm -hmm. To ask the question, what's your relationship to it? What's your relationship to alcohol? Try not drinking for a week, seeing what, seeing what that's like. Oh, you're smoking weed every day. Well, it's interesting. What if you thought of weed as alcohol and you were using alcohol in the way that you use weed every, you know, the way that you use weed? What would that be like? How do you, how, what do you think of that? What would that mean to you? So a lot of it, so I guess um, I focus more on what a person's relationship is to whatever substance or, um, or uh, behavior um, they're engaging in is. And as far as treatment of addiction, I, I would imagine that it depends on the person. It depends on the situation. But these letters that were exchanged between Jung and the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous is something that that I wanted to ask you about because of what Jung said. Jung seems to be well known throughout the 12-step world because Alcoholics Anonymous, I think, was the first of its kind, the first 12-step group that was formed. But then there have been offshoots where there is Alcoholics Anonymous, but there's also Narcotics Anonymous, and there's Overeaters Anonymous, and there's Al-Anon. And so they're all based on this 12-step program that was founded by Bill W. with the help of Jung. Mm -hmm. So what was Jung's role in the formation of Alcoholics Anonymous? Um, Jung had seen a patient in the, in the days, um, you know, there used to be a lot of wealthy Americans that went to go see Jung. Mm-hmm. And, um, and there was a patient um, of his named Ebby Thatcher. I'm sorry, of Roland, Roland Hazard, who's from a wealthy chemical family, I think from Ohio. And um, he was a uh, terrible alcoholic, Um, just just um, um, could not gain control of his alcoholism. It was destroying him. Nothing he did work. So he went to see um, one of the world's preeminent psychiatrists, Jung. And Jung treated him. And then Roland Hazard um, um, thought he was cured, and he went. He started drinking again, and so he went back to Jung, and uh, and Jung basically told. He said, "Am I? You know, can I be cured? Can you help me?" And Jung basically said, um, "Jung was powerless to do anything. That that he couldn't help him." And he said, "You know, there are people like you um, who are hopeless cases, hopeless cases." that no amount of treatment is going to cure your alcoholism. And you can imagine what it is to hear that and to hear that from somebody like Jung. Yeah. And then Roland Hazard said, um, I mean, that is there anything that can be done? And Jung said, well, in certain cases, um, I've seen, uh, uh, um, I've seen people cured uh, through spiritual transformation. That's the only thing that seems to uh, affect a cure. 
is is that there's some form of complete and utter uh, transformation of a person's being, a spiritual transformation. And that's the only thing that seems to have worked. And it doesn't happen with everybody, and it happens by the grace of God. And if it happens, you know, hallelujah. But that's the only thing that's going to work. And so um, Roland Hazard went back and he got involved um, with a religious group at a time called the Oxford Group that, that had their own steps that informed the 12 steps of Alcoholic Anonymous. And he had this spiritual transformation. Um, and, 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 um, and so that was, so the concept of spiritual transformation, and that's the only thing um, that can treat alcoholism is the foundation of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that came from Jung. And Jung said that about Roland, that his craving for alcohol was the equivalent on a low level of the spiritual thirst of our being for wholeness. And he said expressed in medieval language as the union with God. So did Jung come up with that idea of a a religious experience saving the alcoholic because it would replace or what is the function of ingesting this alcohol? What is the person wanting to commune with? So Jung said in the letter, the helpful formula, therefore, is spiritus contra spiritum. And that means spirit against spirit. And I would say that that is a, a kind of foundational and essential statement. And it not only applies to alcohol, but it applies to our experiences as as human beings and all the issues that we face. Because, um, but if we limit it just to alcohol, that um, according to Jung and Jungian theory, that we have a quest for wholeness, that that, that we want to have an experience of wholeness in life. That in some way you could say um, there are ways in which we're broken or there are ways in which we're incomplete. And and within our psyche, uh, we have a a conception and an idea of wholeness. And we tend to project that out onto other things, onto other objects. So if anybody who has ever been, as anybody who's been in love, ever been in love knows or who's had their heart broken, when you fall in love, the other person completes you. The other person becomes your wholeness. And you almost can't exist or live without the other person. And if they don't call you, it can be very painful. If they suddenly break up with you, it can be very painful. Ending relationships can be horrible because in some way we experience our wholeness through the other person. And, um, and so... Uh, that wholeness is um, a quest, let's say, for union with the self. And, and the self um, uh, is the psychological term for the sort of deepest, the, the whole within us, the, the, the largest of large and smallest of small. It's, it's, it's sacred and it's holy and it's mundane and 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 the disgusting and it's the it's 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 the essence and image of wholeness um in our culture and so um and so it's it's the deepest essence of who we are and when we talk about an ego our ego is the sense of i in me so when i say i um i'm talking about my ego how i conceive of and experience myself but that's only part of who we are. We need to have a relationship to the self. Um, some could call it the Buddha nature or Christ consciousness or um, Atman, or um, there are so many different terms through it throughout the world's religions. Um, but we tend to project our wholeness out onto other things. So an alcoholic projects their wholeness onto alcoholism. I'm sorry, onto the al- onto alcohol, mm-hmm. but the alcohol completes them. There's such a hole 
that, that, that anybody who's addicted experiences without the substance, that their being depends on that. So you could say that the alcohol uh, uh, carries their wholeness. And so, uh, so spiritual transformation has to do, when we talk about spiritualism, we're talking about connecting to our wholeness. We're talking about connecting to, um, let's say, what we conceive of as an experience of God. And so what Jung is saying that, um, that the alcoholic mistakes the spirit in the bottle, you know, spirits mm -hmm. for the true spirit, that, that it's the alcohol that they think is going to transform them when that's not really what's, um, what's really going to do it. It's the true spirit. It's God. It's this, uh, you know, quote unquote, God, higher power, the self. Um, Buddha nature, um, whatever we want to call it, this thing that transcends us is what's going to be able to transform us. And so we, you know, non-alcoholics do this all the time. When I talk about being in love, you kind of project, you, you can project your wholeness on another person. And, and when that person goes away, you know, people can become suicidal. What can I do without the person? Or in our culture, we tend to do it on money. Money is the holiest thing. To the alcoholic, it's the alcohol. It's the alcohol that's necessary for life. And yet, there's a mistake because it's a concrete version of the spirit in the bottle versus the true transforming spirit that, that would be available. So basically, in alcoholism or in any kind of addiction, or in life in general, our ego has to become related to something greater than ourselves. So in some way, um, this is a task that is, uh, the, that, that, um, is uh, a sort of given to all of us in some way. Our egos become, how does our ego relate to something greater than itself? The alcoholic, in a sense, their life depends on this task. It's life or death for them yeah. to connect to something greater than themselves, for their ego to submit to something bigger than they are. And the alcoholism pushes them. So uh, um, we Jungians talk about teleology or telos. Where is something heading? What's its purpose? Um, and, and so you could say the teleology, the meaning, the purpose of alcoholism is to connect the sufferer to spirit so their ego can be connected to something greater than themselves and therefore transform them. And I would say in some way, alcoholics are pushed more towards that than are other people. Yeah. It's a gift and a curse. It's, it's, it's what kills you and what can save you. And it's at that level. For most of us who, let's say, aren't addicted, we, we may not realize that it's at that level. You know, that, that it's spiritual life and death that's at mm -hmm. stake. And for the alcoholic, it's spiritual life and death and physical life and death. That is so beautifully said. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today, Michael. Laura, thank you for having me. And this has really been a privilege and an honor and, um, um, and a lot of fun. So thank you. Please visit the website Speaking of Jung, that's J U N G, dot com for more information on everything that was discussed in this episode. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download for free. This podcast is also available on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Amazon Music, and it will be available later in the week on our YouTube channel, Jungian Laura. You can also listen to this episode on your Amazon Echo device simply by saying A-L-E-X-A, -E play speaking of Jung on Apple Podcasts. Just be sure to pronounce Jung with a hard J. Links to Amazon's new Echo devices can be found in the show notes. This is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung. <laughs>